Svandis worked as a gender equality advisor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology for 20 years. And as we all know, academia is based on died in the wool traditions, and it's nearly impossible to change anything. Academia refuses changes unless they are needed. Svandis has many stories to share about how she dealt with authority, leadership, and patriarchal structure and how she used creativity to attain equality. So Sandis, the floor is yours. I'm just going to stop sharing the screen. And then I'm going to spotlight you. Now you are spotlight for everyone, please. Yes. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here. And thank you very much, Salla, for the presentation of me. Um, <clears throat> when I was thinking about uh, giving this uh, le lecture, I thought that um, I'm, I'm only going to talk mostly about positive things because um, uh, COVID time is giving us a lot of hard time. And I think that we, and negative and bad news, and I think that we need some good news. So I will tell you about my journey through academia. It's, it was 20 years, as Allah said, and that, that would mean <clears throat> one minute for each year. Um, well, it won't be like that. Anyway, uh, in the beginning, uh, I think that it helped me a lot that I had been working with uh, organizations, both big and small organizations, um, uh, organizations, psychology, AIDS, uh, and, and things like that. And I am extremely optimistic. I always think that I can get some results. I just have to know how. So in the beginning, the first two years, I was listening, looking, and talking with people, trying to find out how this organization works. And where are the good people? Where are the people who have the same thoughts as I do about uh, equality? <clears throat> and uh, uh, it took, uh, took a long, long time, of course, um, but it was very useful. And uh, in between, I have to admit that every other week, uh, I thought that I must quit my job. It's too difficult. It's too hard. Although I am extremely optimistic, it, I won't make it. And then I called the friend. He was a professor in organizational psychology. And I told him that I, I found it too difficult, actually, and um, asked him for some advice. And then he said, well, aren't you, aren't you working in academia at the university? Yes, I said. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can't uh, expect any results before after about three years. And then I thought, okay, okay, I'll keep on going. And uh, as you all know, money means a lot to everyone, uh, also in business, in academia, and uh, other places. So I, uh, I started to ask for money. I told my boss that I needed a budget. I was going to use the budget for, for some um, tools uh, I had uh, think, uh, thought about. And um, uh, so I just asked him, I want some money. And he said, no, no, you won't get any money. And I kept asking. I said, um, and he, uh, I uh, kept asking for money. I think I did that for about uh, half a year. And then he said, uh, where are you going to get this money? And I said, that's not my problem, that's yours. You have to find this money. And uh, in the end, I decided to uh, write a budget and ask the university board for money. And um, as you probably know, it's very wise to ask for more than you can get or think you can get. So, Instead of asking for 1 million and maybe getting 500,000, uh, I asked for 6 million. Of course, they thought I was mad. 6 million was a lot of money. 
Anyway, I got three millions. And we were the first university in Norway who got so much money for women only. So that was absolutely something to celebrate. And in the appliment, I just said that I am going to use one million for this and one million for that. And a very good explanation of all the tools we were using. And uh, yeah, that was a very good thing. And all of a sudden, the leadership at the university had to discuss uh, um, gender equality in the budget process, which they hadn't done before. That's also important. You know, uh, it's easy when you are working on these challenges that it can become a, a satellite or living its own life away from the, the organization. Everybody knows about it. Few people want to talk about it, but they, they know that it's necessary and they have to do it. So that was my um, uh, first uh, thing to celebrate. And uh, the next thing, and I, will, I can tell you about what I was using the money for. Uh, every year we used about 1 million to recruit women to uh, technology and natural science. And uh, then we have, uh, then I used some money for something called uh, staff packages. We were also the first one to do that. And I thought that if women get the money in the, in the beginning of their uh, full professorships or, or as an associate professor, it would be nice. Uh, it, was, it would also be a signal from the institution that we want to have them here and they are needed. And uh, they could use the money for what they ever like. Uh, they could travel, uh, building networking abroad. They could buy some technical tools. They could, um, um, yeah, pay for some assistance at the lab or anything like that. And uh, you know, the main, my main, uh, what shall I say? Um, uh, I, my main uh, my yeah, main challenge was that more women in professorships. That was the most important thing. We, when I started in the year of 2000, it was only 8.5 women in professor positions. When I left 2020, it was 25 percent. So it's something. And uh, back to the, the, the tools I were using to get results. Um, and uh, we also had this uh, search committees. I found out that uh, the university were using search committees, but only for men. And that means that if you are applying for a position or before it's the announcement, you have to find people to, to apply for it. And uh, I noticed that it was only men. They were finding men to this position. So I said, we need to have a search committee. Finding women, you can go all over the world and they are there. You just have to find them and ask, invite them to us. They could also get money to invite women here to the university, invite them here and uh, tell them about how things work out. And uh, always before the announcement, uh, and uh, yes, we, in the beginning it was called uh, search committees. Uh, then somebody and some leaders came back and said, well, we have been looking and didn't find anyone. So then I said, okay, they have to tell me where they have been looking and uh, who they have been asking. And the name, I changed the name from search committees to to search and find committees. And they were not allowed to come back and say they didn't find any women. It was extremely important. So, uh, um, yes, and then I was, uh, I had many, many good tools. And uh, when it comes to uh, creativity, um, I, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, quite interesting that uh, in academia, you have to be a very, cre very creative, uh, of course, and also when you're working with people. And uh, my, 
mantra, if you can call it, has always been in my work. If you, if what you do, if what you do doesn't work, do something else. You don't have to try it for a very long time, but just remember, if what you're doing doesn't work, try to do something else. Uh, so, um, of course, uh, I, uh, I met many different peoples and uh, I think I have I have used a lot of time to find, as I said instead, find the good ones, find good people. And one way to do that is uh, running mentoring programs, and that was only for women. Every year, for I think it was for 12 or 13 years, and more than um, um, and more than 300 people were participating. Every year, the men came and asked me if they could join the mentoring program, and I said. No, I'm sorry, just look at the statistics, it's not possible. And um, if you find someone you trust, the good person who wants to share his or her uh, um, knowledge and experiences, ask them to be a mentor. This is a very good advice to everyone. It's very good to have a, to have a mentor. And uh, in the, as I said, it was about 300 people. And it was almost the best, uh, Thing about my work. Um, yeah, in the beginning, it was only for, uh, for uh, uh, women and PhD uh, candidates. And then the postdoctors came and said that, well, we want to have a mentor too. And then the uh, associate professors came. Yes, of course, and I always said, yes, of course, welcome, welcome. You can also join the program. And the last one was a professor, and I thought it's never going to end. Everybody wants to have a mentor. But that was because she was new at the university. So she didn't knew, need the mentor to tell, tell about the career, how to do a career. She just needed the mentor to understand the, the university and how it works. So I. I do really recommend the mentor for everyone, from student to, yeah, everybody needs it. Um, as I said, instead, it's very important to uh, uh, remember all the, all the steps you do in a positive direction and celebrate as well. It's extremely important to celebrate. Either you just shout it out, clap your hands, uh, buy a cake, invite your colleagues, or whatever you do. And the next thing I, uh, I was celebrating was that um, there was uh, um, the, what do you call it? Um, it was a national equality, gender equality uh, award. And the ministry from the Ministry of Education education. And when I heard about that, I thought, of course, I have to apply for that. And uh, some of my colleagues uh, said, wow, really? And my boss, he said, forget it, you will never, <laughs> you can't get this price, just forget it. And then I told him that he was not going to be invited to the celebration party. Of course, he said that. And luckily, we won the prize. And it was one and a half million written from that. And, the, and a lot of celebrations, of course. I called my youngest daughter and told her that I had just won one and a half million. And she said, Mom, how great. Finally, we are millionaires. But the money was, of course, not for me. It was for more gender equality tools and activities. Um, I also want to men mention that, as you hear, I talk a lot about gender equality. But the last five years, I also worked on diversity. Um, because, um, because 
many of the challenges for women are the same for uh, people of color, for everyone. So uh, when in the beginning, when they said that we had, to, there was only four gender equality advisors in Norway, it was Oslo, Bergen, Tromsø and Trondheim. And um, then we said, no, it's, it's quite enough working on gender equality, it's enough. We can't work on these other issues too. But of course, of course we did, of course. And uh, the greatest, uh, the greatest thing about my job is all the wonderful people, all the wonderful women and great people I have met. I have met so many great people who are working for the same issues or want to do something about it. And the most important thing is to find them. And it's not by sitting at your desk. So I was running around campus and trying to find people and uh, having a pet dog on, on campus. And uh, well, it was a great time. And also a bit ups and downs. Um, and uh, some of the other tools I was using, I just men mentioned the, the mentoring programs. It was also networking. So we were bringing people together who have the same challenges helps a lot. Speak openly about it. Because many of the women in academia, or some of them at least, think that they are the only one with these uh, challenges. It's only them uh, who can't uh, finish the PhD or, or who have these problems, maybe with a supervisor or people at the department. But when you bring them together and we started talking about all these issues, then all of a sudden they find out that maybe it's nothing about me, it's about the culture, it's about, it's about the structure, it's about academia. And as you know, academia is made by men for men and it took 400 years before the first female students came to both Oxford and, uh, and um, Uppsala University, which is the oldest university in Sweden. So it was, it was great to remember that in between when I was very unpatient and I had to say to myself, Swantis, 400 years, 400 years, remember that. So be patient, be patient. You are going to get results, be patient. And, um, yeah, so networking, bringing people together is, is absolutely necessary in every, in every case. Um, so we had uh, meetings in the lunch time, me and the, the mentees from the mentoring program. The mentees were, as I said earlier, it was PhD candidates, associate professor, postdoc. And the mentors was professor, both women and men. And what was, and they were, it was interdisciplinary. So all the engineer professors, mostly men, uh, they uh, got mentees from the social science and humanity. And all of a sudden they uh, met people from uh, uh, another world who were thinking very different. And um, they um, got new knowledge about how it is to be a woman in academia. and. Uh, they started to think about, well, maybe it's like this at my department too. I never spoke with these ladies about that. And the importance of uh, use, uh, that the uh, program was interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary was that uh, they were not supposed to talk about the, the, their work or, yeah, they were supposed to talk about career. That was, uh, the, and they were not going to uh, compete or being in a concurrent situation with a supervisor. So it was allowed to talk about almost everything and we had a lot of fun. So networking, I re recommend that. And we did it in the last time, eating and talking. Um, 
I was also going to tell you about uh, Uh, if you um, um, if you want to have some tips about uh, ideas about where to read about gendered innovation, which is extremely important, of course, you can just get to the website. It's called Gender Innovation. It's at the Stanford University, and then you can learn about gender innovation in science, health. Uh, engineering, environment, very, very good uh, website. And uh, if you want to read a book, you can also uh, read uh, the book uh, uh, written by Deborah Tannen. And the name is, uh, it's named uh, Working from Nine to Five. And there's also another lady I was very impressed by. She was, I was on a, a lecture by her in Oxford once, and her name, oh, yeah, <laughs> I forgot her name. Uh, she has written a book, book, book called Why So Slow? Oh my God, sorry about the name. But Why So Slow is the name of the book. And that means why does it take such a long time to change things uh, academia? Um, yes, um, so uh, I told Allah that I, I was also going to talk about uh, some uh, survival techniques. And uh, some of them are like Remember that nobody reads your thoughts. So speak out, tell about your ideas and dreams. Uh, and um, always ask for more than you think you can get. Don't excuse yourself too much. Women are very good at that often. And don't ask too much for a permission to do things. Virginia Velia, yeah. Thank you very much, Kari. Yes, Virginia Velia. Yeah, that was the name of the lady who wrote Why So Slow. And, um, and the, just do it, because if you are doing the wrong thing, they will tell you. So it may... Um, <laughs> Well, I did that and it really worked. Because if you are always asking for a permission, permission to do things, uh, people might say no, or it's the system is not like that. And uh, when your ideas pop up, uh, the bureaucracy is often doesn't work with you. So I remember often when I was saying, I'm going to do this and this and that and that. And then I heard a lot, uh, you can't do that. No, it's not possible. And I said, why not? So just do it. If it's wrong, somebody will tell you. And um, yeah, it was Deborah Tannen who wrote Nine to Five. Is, is, uh, the reason I like the book is because it's a uh, lot of interesting um, uh, ideas about how things are at work between women and men. And remember that men of quality are men of equality. I guess you know a lot of them. And uh, yes, uh, I, I use a lot of humor. Humor is very important. When you work with difficult things like gender and diversity, I use a lot of humor. And uh, as I said, sometimes I didn't want to read about all the difficult things. I just kept going and thought that uh, now I have to find a new direction. And if this doesn't work, I'll try to find something else. Yes, so it was about what I was what I was going to talk about. And I know that after this session, I am surely going to think about all the things I did not say and forgot to say. But at this time, this is. <laughs> This is what I have. 
So thank you, thank you again very much for inviting me and I hope you enjoy this. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, we have our first comment um, on in chat hmm. from iPhone. Okay. <laughs> uh, Spondid, you're such an inspiring person and I couldn't agree more. Uh, if you guys have any um, questions, please either you can um, raise your hand and we will unmute you or you can uh, send your question in chat so that we um, read it out loud. Well, actually, I do have a question. Um, so you definitely know the uh, Nordic gender equality paradox. Um, yes. So for people that don't know what it is, it's uh, in Scandinavia, we are very well aware of gender inequality and we are talking about it so much and we're so progressive, yet the uh, Nordics, uh, the Scandinavia, like Denmark and Norway, we are still far behind. Um, as I remember correctly, um, uh, the numbers, the pay gap in, I think, Denmark uh, is around 15%. Uh, while in uh, countries like, for instance, uh, Italy or Romania, it's 5%. So why do you think um, is the reason? Are there any maybe um, historical factors or um, also maybe it's too naive to ask what could be done? What can we do? So I have many questions, but if you could just um, talk about it and... Well, yes, I totally agree about this gender paradox because uh, we are very good uh, of uh, talking about things, but not not so good doers. And it's of course also about culture a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember when I was traveling around in Europe and talking about gender equality, it was quite different from Spain, from France, Italy, uh, Germany, Lithuania, and uh, but the, the challenges were pretty much much alike. But it was also about the culture of uh, uh, what are you supposed to talk about or not. Quotas, for instance, was very difficult to talk about in other countries while, while we were talking it, talking about it here in Norway. And I also remember that, um, uh, that somebody said to me that um, you have such a lot of money in Norway. You have all this oil money. You can just pay for this uh, gender equality things. You have so much money. And I said, no, 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 no. It's not about the money. No, it's about the culture. It's about the, all the biases, you know, that which auto automatically come in your minds about the, the differences between women and, and men. And as you all know that uh, when we, gender equality is pretty much about how we behave to each other, how people behave, how we treat each other, and also about how we talk about each other. Because we have tendencies, both women and men, to talk uh, uh, you, up and down. As a, when, when you talk about men, you, you, uh, um, you use very strong words like uh, extremely good, uh, excellent, and all these things, but you don't do it when it comes to women. Uh, yes, I know it's a paradox. Uh, we have many good things, but we have a lot to do. But in Iceland, where I came from, they they have now laws uh, laws about the pay pay gap. Uh, it's in the in the law, mm. so I ho really hope that it works. Although, yes, I think so. I think it's the first uh, country which has done that. Mm. And always ask when you are. Uh, when to have more wages because women uh, are not as good as some men or men in that. They ask for a little. So remember what I said, ask for more than you think you can get. <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Okay, let's see. Um, are there any um, other questions? Uh, 
Okay, I don't see any in the... No, I don't see anything in the chat. Okay. But you are from um, Iceland. Are there any big cultural differences between uh, Norway and Iceland? Something that you have noticed and I'm not asking like better or worse, just mm -hmm. different. Yeah. Well, I think uh, one of the differences is that uh, I am not afraid of authorities. Mm -hmm. And that might uh, be because we are a little country, you always have somebody in your family which is a director or have a higher position. You know that it's just normal people, but they have this position. So I think it, uh, it helps a lot not having any authority or what you call it. I, I don't fear authorities. So I was outspoken to all the leaders, the deans, the department leaders, and so on. I, I, would, I would just call them and say, why do you do that? You have to do this and so on. And another thing is that um, this uh, very positive, of course. And, uh, and uh, sometimes it was actually positive to be a, a, a foreigner uh, because I could just say that, well, Anyway, we are doing it like this in Iceland, and it works. And then they could just shake their heads and say, well, well, anyway, she's a foreigner, she's an Icelander, okay. So it could also be a positive thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Norman, uh, people from Norway are much more uh, um, patient or... or uh, I think they should uh, be more, not so much afraid of saying what they think. Um, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, um, very good trust, very good people, but they could be more critical or <laughs> speak out, shout more. Uh, let's see, we have a question from Alice. She asked to... Let's see, ask to unmute. I saw it was something about the pay cut, I think. Hi. Oh, sorry. I'm, I have a baby feeding, so it's harder to type. <laughs> um, hi. Hi, I'm Alice, and this is Graham, my husband, and this is Maya. She says, thank you for all the wisdom. <laughs> and um, she's, she is listening, even though she's, you know, feeding. But really, really quickly, I don't want to take up too much time, but like just a little background. I am from Taiwan originally, but also American and Swedish, and Graham is from the US. And so, and uh, we just had her 20 days ago. And so oh. this has been a really interesting experience um, with the postpartum period. But like first about academia, we're both geologists, like academics um, who have been in academia in the US, also in Taiwan and in Norway. And so a lot of, okay, maybe we gave you. <laughs> Time to go to daddy. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, I think maybe easier to talk then. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your patience. This is really perfect for the theme. Of <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, Alice. Good. <laughs> He's cooperating. Okay. So basically, I'm just trying to paint a little bit of background to say that, like, we, I mean, what you're saying to me, at least, you know, Graham should chime in, but like so on point and so many levels in terms of this experience of like resistance to change in academia. And then also this like power dynamic, gender dynamic, like all of it totally um, resonates. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a different question or yeah, I had a different question sort of concerning our immediate experience of like, being foreigners and doing the birth and postpartum process in Norway. And basically I think that's what I'm trying to say is that there's like a lot of what you're saying, uh, Swandis, is, is so much like the academic stuff that you're describing. It, to me, it's really, really describing also the medical stuff that we've gone through. So like the academic institution and the medical institution, like I'm hearing basically like a lot of the same words that you're saying is what I've been saying this past 20 days. And like, maybe there are some um, folks here who are participating or on 
watching on Facebook or watching this video later recorded that basically like anyone who has some kind of like contact with the medical field in Norway who wants to reach out or like I would love to have some follow up conversation with anyone who wants to sort of draw this parallel into the medical side. And not in a way to say like, oh, Norway medical system so bad. Like, it's not about that. It's like a bigger systemic thing that I've been like trying to convince everyone around me. But like, everyone's like, oh, like maybe you're like overthinking it or it's like too big. Like you're trying to take on something too big. And I was like, no, it's like, it's a big thing. And there's a cultural aspect. Anyway, I'll, I'll like cut it short just to say like, I just want to plant the seed that if anyone wants to like, um, like follow up um, Swandis directly with you would be a huge honor, but like anyone also. Um, yeah, so would love to have um, continue to have some kind of platform for like, not just saying like continue with the academic, but also like pulling that parallel into the medical. Cause I, to me, like the, the sort of what you said, like institutions made for men by, made by men for men. It's like, so seems so correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I hope that all made sense. It's just like so sort of spontaneous. That totally um, made sense. Thank you, Alice. Yeah. And then I think lastly, it's just like you, you had a quick question, right? Yeah. Uh, pertaining to the, the women in academia, I recently learned that in Norway, apparently there are the um, a majority of people in uh, students in higher education are are women now, according to the Norska uh, Samfunskapsprøven. I'm not sure about uh, in PhD programs, but uh, as well as this, uh, how do you, or do you foresee that translating in, in, into uh, positions, pr professorships, researchers, etc., uh, in the in the near future? Well, you said that it was more women than men, but it depends on uh, the discipline. Uh, as you know, it's uh, mostly in the, in the health science. Okay. Women are, but they are not in, in technology and other things. And, and when it comes to uh, the future and all the things that is, is going to happen in the future, it depends on the engineering. It depends on technology. And the technology is, of course, made for both women and men in the society. Um, so we need to do something about that. And of course, we also need more men in the health science. And I also want to come back to your wife when you said that uh, you were talking about the healthcare system. And uh, last year, I have thinking a lot about uh, that. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, often uh, people don't believe what women are saying. It's like you are talking <laughs> Or, or, or nobody believes you. Also, you, you can notice it in the healthcare system. You know your body best yourself, but when you come, you meet the health system. In between, they think uh, they talk to you like you don't know anything at all, and uh, and uh, it's also like this in the judgment system or law. And uh, I think it's it's extremely important to listen to women and believe what they're saying. Uh, otherwise, it's what would it be? Are they all playing? Are they acting? Or why don't we believe them? Mm -hmm. Because that's a, that's a very important uh, topic. Yeah. Yeah, I think that answer is right. Thank you so much. And just on to like finalize that, it's like totally true about not being heard and not being listened to. Like last week, they wanted to send me to a mental institution because they thought I was having like. A nervous breakdown mm. postpartum mm -hmm. and like because I was talking about the same things like you were talking about just now it's like totally lucid totally makes sense and like to me I was like you everyone else who doesn't believe me is crazy but like how do I convince them that like my experience is real and it's like my instinct is correct <laughs> and mm. like finally like got people on board sorry and then but yeah they were like they were about about to without even really proper like direct um assessment on me in person where like our first recommendation is to send you to uh to admit you and separate your child and your husband from you so i have a whole story to tell that i'm happy to tell whenever but just to show that like all i needed was to have my own 
space and like get back on my sleeping schedule my own way with people who were like, yeah, you're fine. It's okay. But then they wanted to go from zero to 2000 and like separate me from my child. So I think that really highlights a really big problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So just, uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, I'll mute myself now because I keep talking. Yeah, well, thank you, Alice. I think we have one more question in the chat from Kari. She says, thank you for your inspiring talk and words of wisdom on this. I'm curious about your thoughts on this statement by professor-in-law who recently stated in the newspaper Kronos that kvinneculturen i akademia are problemet. Women's culture in academia is the problem. Referring to, amongst other things, how women may hold each other down uh, through competition and jealousy. Do you feel like that is supported by research? Well, <clears throat> yeah, I will. I have to admit that uh, <clears throat> I have noticed it too. Yes, I have. And um, uh, yes, for instance, entering a room where, with, um, the leadership at one department, maybe one or two women and the rest men. And uh, in the beginning of the meeting, it was often the woman who said something negative. And uh, you might be wondering why. And I also was wondering why. And I uh, thought that they either wanted to show me that there was nothing wrong with the gender equality issues or things of their department or telling me that she wasn't a part of it or she was a, thought she was in a competition for with another woman women, instead of uh, staying with with them so uh, women's solidarity is of course extremely important but i have also noticed that um, jealousy and uh, other things uh, it was it might even be easier to talk about uh, your issues abroad than at home. So it's quite interesting. That's more about the human being. <laughs> I don't, don't have any good answers, but yes, I have noticed and experienced that. But that's not, not absolutely not the biggest uh, problem. No, no, no. The part of it. OK. I think I actually have a question for you on this that I hope is, it's kind of related to that, but I find uh, I moved from the US and in the US I was self-employed. Mm -hmm. And I find that here people are quite suspicious of this, um, especially women actually, other women, like they're worried that I'm not being feminist enough, that this idea of wanting, because I'm a painter, so, I, I get a lot of questions about like whether I'm taking my hobby too seriously or things I'm not used to being asked since I'm educated as a painter and I show and I'm, you know, I came here to do a master's degree in that. And I was curious if that was a Scandinavian, like, do you think there's an, a kind of career that women are sort of supposed to have to support the feminist effort? And do you have any advice for people who may want to do something non-traditional? Well, if people are saying negative things to you or taking your energy or things like that, then you can just ask them back uh, why they are doing this and don't you want me to have success or, or is it like only men are allowed to have success or why not me? Because in between when people say things like that, it's not, they are not tending to do it, but they do it anyway. So a good advice is to, is to either to ask them to repeat, their, uh, to repeat what they're saying, and then hopefully they understand that it's not a good thing. And, uh, hey, uh, and throw the ball back and say, why do you want to know? Or, and uh, this is one of the survival treatment, <laughs> survival <laughs> techniques. One of these, you know, uh, try to stay with the good people. And uh, I remember one time in my <laughs> period, I, I gave advice to many of the young women and it was like, uh, 
I think it was uh, Han Thum or who said that uh, be good with the good ones and bad with the bad one. Mm. Well, I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So try to yeah, do that. That's very good advice. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, it's like when someone says, says a very sexist joke, um, it's a good advice to just ask them to repeat instead of laughing or making this awkward laugh, like, haha, funny. Just ask them with a straight face, uh, sorry, can you repeat? I don't understand your joke. And then if they, uh, if they insist on the same joke, just, I'm sorry, I don't get it. So hopefully uh, while they're explaining this joke to you, they will understand that this is not a good joke. So yeah. this is something that I really want to do uh, once in my life, <laughs> but I haven't done it yet. Can I just add something? Because I have not been talking so much about sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. And I have been working with that all the years, all the years. And uh, for some years ago, I thought that when this, when Me Too uh, campaign came, it would, which, which was a great thing. And um, then I wanted to have, uh, talking about creativity, I wanted to have a, a button called uh, Me Too with the hashtag Me Too, one of the most hacked hashtags used in, in the world, I think. Uh, and uh, then, uh, of course, uh, people in academia said that, no, 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 it's not possible to have a, have a button on the website where it's like hashtag me too. It was, it was really too much. It was too much. But, but I said, you know, everybody understands it. So we also have to, we can't say uh, Varsling or use some Norwegian words because we have foreigners from uh, 90 countries, so, but I didn't go through with that, uh, but other things. So uh, sexual harassment is, of course, has been one of my uh, things to work with. Academic arrogance, abuse of power, white men privilege, lack of equality and all these things. But always uh, see the bright side, celebrate the small steps and keep going. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see, do we have more questions? Uh, I, uh, I don't see any more questions. Well, um, thank you, Sandis, so much. I think we had some really interesting conversations going here, and I hope that we will be able to discuss it uh, outside Creative Mornings. And thank you, everybody who watched this uh, talk today. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out and send a message to our uh, Instagram or Facebook, and then we can um, have the conversation going. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and your weekend, and we will see you next month. Thank you so much. Bye, Alice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you can have time. Yeah. Thank you, Svandis, and thank you, Ala, for organizing. Thank you, Erin, for helping, and happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and have a nice summer, everyone. Very nice summer. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. not in Trondheim, maybe. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> the sun is going to shine on us. So, yeah, of course. Thank you very much, Allah, for inviting me. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs>